Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I am so thrilled and excited to have Dr. Ronald Siegel with us today. Ron Siegel is an assistant professor of psychology part-time at Harvard Medical School, where he has taught for over 35 years. He is a longtime student of mindfulness meditation and serves on the board of directors and faculty of the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy. He teaches internationally about the application of mindfulness practice in psychotherapy and other fields and maintains a private clinical practice in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Ron is also the author of The Mindfulness Solution, Everyday Practices for Everyday Problems, co-author of Back Sense, A Revolutionary Approach to Halting the Cycle of Chronic Back Pain, and Sitting Together, Essential Skills for Mindfulness-Based Psychotherapy. He's also the co-editor of Mindfulness and Psychotherapy, Second Edition, and author of the new book, The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary, Finding Happiness Right Where You Are, which is what we're going to be focused on today because it is such an important conversation for, I believe, every leader, every person in our world to listen to. So thank you very much, Ron, for being here with us today. Thanks so much for inviting me. So, Ron, how about we start with sharing a little bit of what do you mean by the extraordinary gift of being ordinary? Uh, well, the extraordinary gift of being ordinary is actually what we experience as we find relief from our struggles not to simply be ordinary. So many of us spend so much of our time either feeling somehow not good enough feeling down in the dumps, like we're not living up to some expectation, we're not doing quite as well as some peer that we're comparing ourselves, we're not the person we want to be, or we're feeling more or less on top of our game, but we're pretty stressed out trying to make sure that we stay on top of our game so that we don't wind up falling into uh, feeling not good enough in some way. And the extraordinary gift of being ordinary is, is really a pathway toward more sustainable uh, routes to well-being than our trying to feel good about ourselves. And uh, I'm sure we'll get into this, but this instinct to try to feel good about ourselves is deeply rooted in our biology. It's deeply rooted in virtually all human societies. And we're often so engrossed in it that we're like fish in water. We don't even notice that we're caught in trying to win at a game that ultimately is unwinnable. Oh my goodness. I imagine that people listening are really resonating with what you're sharing and probably feeling some of that, you know, inner competitiveness, either with their own image of themselves of how they should be or could be, or, you know, them needing to be like others or like how they used to be. And, and, and it's, it really is such a, a struggle for a lot of people. Um, so how do we shift that? And, and, and why should we shift that? Well, I, I think it's actually helpful to step back in shifting this to see why it's such a universal human uh, difficulty. Um, you know, if, if if we were to go on a so-called safari on the African savanna, which means riding around a jeep with a naturalist, uh, the naturalist would point out this pattern in species after species after species. There would be a dominant male surrounded by literally a harem of reproductively promising females. And then over in the next field, there would be another bunch of usually another bunch of males, usually a bit younger, doing the species specific equivalent of playing football or basketball, trying to hone their skills to become dominant. We look at other species and we look at birds, for example, and they're constantly organizing themselves into pecking orders, right? About who's on top. There are species of crickets that if you put them together into a box, inside of a few seconds, they'll organize themselves into a dominance hierarchy. And in fact, if you take um, human children um, by the age of four and put them into groups of three, they'll organize themselves into what are called transitive dominance hierarchies. Now, this is the principle of transitivity that we get from, um, uh, from math, that if A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, then A is bigger than C. So if Juanita is able to boss around Johnny and Johnny 
is able to boss around Sally. Sally knows that Juanita is the big cheese and she's got to watch out and kowtow to, to Juanita. Now, what's up with this? What's up with this enormous, enormous concern for who's on top? Well, it turns out that historically, being on top conferred evolutionary advantage. It conferred the advantage of being able to have a better shot at reproductive success and being able to send more of your resources to your kids or, you know, in the case of uh, partnered primates, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the other parent, so they take care of your kids so that more DNA would be passed down. So we might imagine that back in the day, they were really happy hominids who were holding hands, singing kumbaya, not comparing themselves to one another, not concerned with their social rank, but sadly, historically and statistically, they weren't our ancestors because they didn't have as much reproductive success as the ones who were clawing themselves to the top of whatever group they're a part of. So we have this very strong instinct. Luckily, we also have other instincts. We'll talk about instincts toward cooperation, toward nurturing, toward caring for one another. But the instinct for being on top is pretty strong. And it's shared in so many with so many different species. And the way it shows up in humans, the way we notice it every day, isn't so much, you know, literally doing the stuff that chimps do, right, to, uh, to prove their dominance, but it's with concerns over self-esteem. It's all the thoughts that go through our day all day long about how am I doing? Gee, do I look good this morning? Uh, am I thin enough? Um, am I kind enough? Um, am I being a good friend? Uh, am I successful at work? Is the other person more successful? Is the other company doing better than mine? What's my boss going to think about me given this? What are you thinking about me as an audience right now as I speak to you? Are you thinking, oh, he's a smart and interesting guy with something useful to say? Or are you thinking, oh, I know all this stuff. This is a bunch of crap. I'm not interested in this. All of those kinds of concerns, just to give you an idea what goes through my mind, all of these kinds of concerns, right, tend to fill our waking hours. And in fact, if we look, you know, if we step back and look at the culture, my God, we're constantly selling one another the image of being higher somehow in our social rank, you know, buy this car, go on this vacation, be with this person, you're going to feel good about yourself. And that's going to be important for your well-being. So, so we start in terms of freeing ourselves from this by just looking humbly at how hard it's going to be, right? Because this stuff is so strongly hardwired, how pervasive it is around us and in our cultures. And then we begin to watch it. We begin to notice Every time we're in an interaction, every time we're doing something, every time we open an email or receive a text, whether we start to feel a little bit better about ourselves, like, ah, yes, I'm having success here. Yes, people are liking me. Yes, I get to feel good about myself. Yes, I'm a good person. Yeah, whatever the criteria is. Or is it a moment of collapse in which we're feeling, uh, I'm not cutting it. I'm not doing so well. This isn't going well. People aren't going to think so highly of me. I'm not going to think so highly of me and, and start to sink. So we start by simply observing the process. <laughs> and as you were speaking, you know, I found myself even kind of doing that as you kind of even pointed out for yourself, you know, oh, I forgot to put on my necklace today. Oh, I don't, whatever. I, I mispronounced a word in the introduction, you know, it's all of that. And it's so interesting. And I have done some work on myself, you know, I'm, I'm relatively self-aware. And yet, I mean, it's pretty amazing how this is going on all the time. Well, well, and the more self-aware we become, the more horrifying this is because, because we start to realize, oh my gosh, it's happening moment by moment by moment. There are almost no moments in which there isn't some degree of self-evaluative thought going on in which we're feeling a little bit better or a little bit worse about ourselves. It, 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 it can be, uh, work on the book was really interesting because I was marinated for some years in this theme and it was like, oh my God, Every situation um, turns into this, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I hang out with uh, uh, people in the meditation world a lot, and uh, people who are involved in spiritual practices and mental health professionals. And there, you see, you know, it, it's not just like looks and money and whether you're in the in crowd or not, or um, 
or whether your product's selling or what's your position in the organization, but it's like, who's more self-preoccupied? Who's more concerned with ego, right? Who, who's less enlightened? Who's more, <laughs> you know, like we, you know, the, our, our capacity for social comparison is so unbounded that we'll turn anything, no matter how noble, no matter how potentially lovely into another, another realm for social comparison. You know, and I think also about like beliefs, right? I mean, you talk in the book about cultural kind of, you know, beliefs. And it's and it's so interesting how we were brought up in a certain way. And that's because, as you said, from an evolutionary perspective, that is how we are hardwired. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's different in certain cultures and others. But as you said, at some level, we all, you know, self-evaluate. Um, and, and we're either feeling better or feeling worse, um, based on our own measures. And and virtually all human societies have these ranking systems. They're virtually all of our societies are hierarchical in some ways. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, it's extremely obvious, like, you know, a caste system that you, you know, that you see in the, you know, the Asian, um, in South Asia, um, but also, my gosh, you know, virtually every society has had in groups and out groups and leadership groups and 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 has winners and losers. And we go to school and from very early on we're we're comparing how we're doing to the other kids, whether it's literally getting grades. But even if you're in the Montessori school or something that's not doing that and is, and is, is trying to soften this. You know, the comparison, I mean, just think back to childhood. How many moments did we all have in which we either felt good about ourselves? You know, I mean, for me, it would be something like, oh, you know, my dad's smiling because I'm using a big word, right? And, and, and uh, you know, he thinks I'm... I'm sounding smart to him and he's an educator, so that matters. Or, you know, being picked, uh, you know, last or next to last for the kickball team and, you know, in in third grade, you know, these ups and downs you know, constant and this kind of social comparison. It, it's just, um, it's its so built in to everything we humans do. You know, so my mind is going to, okay, so how is it a problem, right? Because sometimes we can say, all right, we self-evaluate and it might not be a problem if we're conscious that we're doing it and conscious of what, how we're feeling and and, and managing that you know, and sometimes it's a very, very big problem. So how how do you see this as a problem, if at all? Sure. Well, well, certainly there's a role for um, for simply um, sober and clear self-evaluation just so we can make decisions, right? If if my knowledge of anatomy is limited to carving a Thanksgiving turkey, I probably shouldn't do brain surgery on my friend. You know, if, um, uh, if my most athletic endeavor was a walk around the block, I probably shouldn't sign up for climbing Everest, right? We want to know what our capacities are. Um, But the way that this becomes so problematic for us is it feels so good when we feel good about ourselves, right? You know, just think back to the last moment, um, if I can put you on the spot, you know, the last moment in which you did something where one of the criteria you used to evaluate yourself was working out well, you know, if it's attractiveness, you felt attractive, if it's intelligence, you felt intelligent, if it's kindness, you felt kind. And the feeling inside, right, when we're feeling good about ourselves. I don't know what it is for you. You know, for me, it's like I sit taller, my chest actually expands a little bit. Um, and I feel competent and like I can face the world and all that. What's your experience like when you have one of these self-esteem boosts, if you will? Yeah. So I can think of one yesterday. I had a conversation with somebody and I got to help her with something. And it was one of those moments where I just felt like, you know, pinching myself. Am I really getting to do this? How grateful I am to interact with this individual, let alone like get to help her uh, and have her acknowledge. And (laughs) You know, and she replied with an email, like, you are a rock star in my world. And it was like, wow, I am a rock star in her world. It was just like such a boost. And immediately, yes, I mean, I can feel it right now. The, the, you know, just a feeling of competence and, and, you know, and, and just feeling really good. Like I am, I'm good enough, right? Here I am getting to help somebody who's a huge mentor of mine. And, you know, it was just, um, it was a huge boost to the self-esteem. 
Yeah, no, and it's, and it's a great feeling and wonderful and it doesn't last right <laughs> because it doesn't take much to then think of the the last time that we had an experience where the opposite happened right where where we felt like i wasn't living up to uh expectations i wasn't doing so well the other person got the thing i wanted i i was left out i you know they didn't want me and you know for me it's like i feel it as a literal collapse you know chest moves inward slumping if i was a dog i'd have my tail between my leg legs and um uh, I, I don't want to bum you out, but make you recall it, but it's painful, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, and it's the little things I can think of something also yesterday that I saw that it was like, oh, you know, really? You know, it was like, they don't like me. You know, it was yeah. one of those. And it was just such a minor thing. It was just, you know, seeing that somebody unsubscribed to something. It was such a stupid, silly thing. But but it was a moment of like sadness, like, oh, am I doing something wrong? What am I not doing good enough? And it's just ridiculous, right? Because it doesn't mean anything. But it's but this is this is what it's like, right? I mean, if, if we're honest with ourselves, we start to notice these fluctuations happening all the time. And what's problematic is whenever there is a um a big contrast between two different human feeling experiences it's an area that's ripe for addiction. Um, let's take cocaine, for example. I don't have a lot of experience with cocaine, but my understanding is that when people snort cocaine or smoke crack, right, they feel very, very good for a while. In fact, it's like a self-esteem boost, right? There's all this energy and power and sexual virility and all these wonderful feelings. But when it wears off, it's kind of the opposite. Not a lot of energy, not a lot of good feeling about ourselves, feeling kind of weak and and not prepared for the world. So what do we do when we're down? Well, let's find more cocaine, right? Like the, you know, addictive processes are like this. It's when something feels bad versus something feeling good. And we can try to hold on to the good and avoid the bad. We constantly do the thing to try to hold on to the good. So what happens is we constantly go after these self-esteem boosts. Why is that a problem? Two reasons. One is what we might call um, narcissistic or self-esteem recalibration. The things that used to float our boat don't do it anymore. Think back, um, uh, I think you told me you grew up in Israel. Is that correct? As a young child? I don't know if they had this in Israel. There's a um, certainly a game in the United States uh, or a toy in which there are concentric rings, multicolored in either wood or plastic that have holes in the middle. And then there's a pole. And the idea is to put them on in size order so that you get a cone or a Christmas tree type, type shape when you're done. And there was a time where that really floated my boat, right? I, I still have the memory, right, of, of, of putting this, this together. Now, not so much today, right? I mean, there may be a time in the, you know, in the nursing home where once again, that'll float my boat, but at least <laughs> at this stage in life, not so much. And, and we can think of everything, you know, learning to walk, uh, learning how to do arithmetic, going to school, um, you know, riding a bike, um, uh, having your first boyfriend or girlfriend, getting your first job or your first apartment, or if you ever owned a car, getting your first car, you know, all of these kinds of things. I, I often uh, do trainings for mental health professionals and uh, mental health professionals typically worked very hard for their terminal degree. Many of them took, you know, eight years, 10 years to get a, um, a terminal degree in a mental health field. And uh, at the time, I say, remember what that was like when you um, finally got your degree and how that felt. And people can remember the feeling of accomplishment or, or pride or recognition. And then I say, so how many of you woke up this morning feeling pretty good about yourself because you had your degree? And, you know, everybody starts laughing, right, in the audience. Sometimes there's one newly minted clinician who'll say, raise their hand and say, why is everybody laughing, right? Because, they, you know, they haven't yet habituated to it. But the problem is we habituate to all of these things. So nothing actually sustains us. We keep needing the next level. You know, let's say your podcast gets, you know, really, really, really a lot of, of viewers. Well, there's going to be somebody else with the podcast that's got, that plus a little bit more, right? Because I don't know, they're a famous actor or politician, whatever it is. You know, there's always get so we keep recalibrating. We keep 
comparing ourselves to other groups, comparing ourselves to other criteria, and we need more to try to feel good enough. As though that weren't enough, the other problem with this is, I think of it as the Newtonian problem. What goes up comes down, right? Um, let's say we're really at the top of our game. Let's say we're literally an Olympic gold medalist, right? Best person at this sport in the world. What are the chances of being the best one in the world in four years? Maybe. Eight years? Not so likely. 12 years? Quite unlikely now, right? So even if we actually manage to be at the pinnacle of success, it's, we're not going to stay up. So that's why we're endlessly either stressed out trying to keep this up or bummed out because it's not working. So for those people that really wish to have a different form of self-evaluation, if you will, or to shift that all together, what can they do? To, to find that deeper sense of enoughness or whatever yeah. that is, not from anything external? Well, there, there are a number of things that, that help. The first one is simply doing what we're doing right now, which is shining light on this. Because the more we can see ourselves moment by moment, going up or going down, the more we start to get, oh yeah, this is actually a considerable source of suffering in my life. And we also start to see that it's a considerable source of suffering in other people's lives. And we start to see how we can actually be bringing the suffering to others when in trying to feel good about ourselves, we do, you know, showing off stuff to try to feel better about ourselves. But then the other person starts to feel inadequate in, in some way. So, so the first is simply bringing attention to this. I've worked a lot with mindfulness practices over the years and um, mindfulness practice helps. Uh, actually spending some time in meditation practice each day so that you really notice what's happening Happening moment to moment in the heart and mind uh, during our day, because we can you can really start to see the fluctuations, and that that is uh, that's step number one. Um, then there are a number of antidotes that are that are quite powerful. Probably the most powerful one is to start to shift toward making a connection, not an impression, in our lives. Um, the so often when we're interacting with another <clears throat> human being, we're thinking, how do I look? How do I sound? You know, was that smart? Do they like me? Do they not like me? All of these different kinds of self-evaluative thoughts that are basically focused on me and how I'm doing in the world. It is possible in that very same moment, to actually shift the emphasis and think, how can I better connect with this other person? And, we all know this when we're in um, in genuine and good friendships. Like if we're with a friend and we're spending time together and we're talking and we're really being honest, at least I wind up telling them about my fears. I tell them about my foibles. I tell them about um, my hopes. Um, and I'm vulnerable with them. I, you know, I, you know, I, I share with them how challenging it is to be a human being in the world. Um, and then if they do the same, the whole thing changes, right? The whole, you know, the concern with what are they thinking about me disappears because we start to, in fact, our very sense of self shifts. We stop feeling like a me and we start feeling like part of a we in this moment when we're with the friend. And there's this warmth that comes from connection that is so powerful and is sustaining in a whole other way. It's not, hey, I'm the most special friend they've got or I'm really a wonderful person. I'm just a regular old ordinary human being, but I feel connected to this other person. And that is such a game changer. And of, of course we can do that when meeting the future in-laws or at the job interview also, but it's but we can do it all day long. We can start to shift. When I'm in a in a teaching role, like like right now, I can be doing this role mostly thinking about how am I doing? What are you in the and and our viewers thinking about me? Are, you know, well, are they going to like me or not? Or I can be thinking, what's going to be 
how can I be skillful here? And what's going to make other people feel like they can let down their guard? And we can connect around this. And uh, you know, we were talking before before we we started the interview, and you were you know you were graciously thanking me for participating. And I was saying, look, I love doing these interviews because every time I do it, I remind myself a little bit about why this matters, and I inch a tiny bit towards sanity around this. Like it brings me in the right direction. So if I'm doing this interview with that as a purpose, then it's it's a whole other experience. And we can do that in so many different realms of our lives. Um, and there's data to support that this makes sense to do. I have a um, a, a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, his name is uh, Bob Waldinger. And he, he he wears a number of hats that we usually don't see together. Uh, so he's a, uh, he's a psychiatrist. Uh, and he's actually a Harvard psychiatrist at one of the kind of flagship Harvard uh, hospitals. Uh, he's a psychoanalyst. Uh, and he happens to be a Zen priest. These things don't go together uh, a lot of times. Um, and uh, he's the head of what's called the Harvard Study for Adult Development, which is the uh, the long Harvard Study of Adult Development. And it's the longest running longitudinal study of human well-being. And it started in 1938 with um, a group of 700 odd uh, Harvard undergraduates. They, Harvard was all male back then, so they were they were men. Um, and uh, it was uh, it was actually half uh, Harvard undergraduates and half poor kids from um, uh, from the city of Boston. And they've been following them since 1938, and some of them are still alive. And at first they were, you know, doing what they had to, you know, blood pressure and weight and the kinds of measurements. It got into sophisticated, you know, lipid analyses, blood chemistries. And then they got very sophisticated. They started interviewing not just the, the men, but their families, their wives, their kids, really trying to get at every possible angle for looking at well-being, both physical well-being and mental well-being. And Bob, you can catch his um, TED talk about this. Uh, uh, Bob will tell you, you know, the jury is in. We now know what the critical variable is for human well-being, and it's the quality of our relationships. And it's it's not how successful or not we were in all sorts of other realms. It's whether we're in relationships that have trust as a as a central component. It doesn't even matter if you bicker a lot. I find this very helpful because you know my wife and I argue a lot, but it's a feeling that this person would have my back and I would have their back, that that we care about one another. That comes from connection. That, you know, so it's, you know, it's just clear that this is a whole alternative. And it's it's actually tapping a whole other instinct system we have. Because we have an instinct system that's about getting our drives met, you know, making sure we have enough food, making sure we have uh, sexual contact. If we've got sexual interest, make sure we've got shelter and warmth. We have a drive system that's all about fight or flight, right? You know, dealing with emergencies and either running away or aggressively dominating the other. And then we've got this third system, which is sometimes called the mammalian tendon befriend system. It's our nurturing system. It's our system that totally comes alive with our with our kids. Not so much if they in their their adolescence if they're obnoxious, but most of the time with with our kids, where you know we just want the best for them, we just want to care for them in this way. Well, that system is what gets activated when we really make a safe social connection, and it's a it's another instinctual system that serves as a counterpoint to the system of you know making sure that we uh, prove our social rank in some way and feel good about ourselves we stop feeling good or bad about ourselves we simply start to feel connected and loved and loving and it's it, it's a whole other channel to be operating on you know just yesterday i had a new client here he you know sold his company you know is doing very well uh, you know, and he shared that he's just been really unhappy. You know, he hasn't had the kind of connection, you know, even with his family abroad, you know, it's very kind of surface level. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. You know, with his spouse, it's not, <clears throat> you know, a, a deeper conversations like they used to have, you know, with younger kids and so on now, uh, you know, and he, he said he's feeling really disconnected, you know, and it's so aligned with what you're sharing you know, there's, you know, even though he has all the stuff, right, the money, the whatever, but yet there's a deeper level of, uh, you know, kind of a simmering uh, sadness, a simmering kind of disconnect. 
and and really missing to to have those more meaningful conversations again with people as you shared like to really be honest about how we feel and what's happening you know the real stuff and it's and it's becoming more and more rare these days it seems and and i know certainly for a lot of leaders it's very lonely up at the you know quote top because you know, they they may not feel that they can share what's really going on with their teams because they don't want to instill fear or doubt or anything like that. You know, so so what um, do you think is a is a is a helpful approach to doing this? I mean, certainly we can ask ourselves the question: How can I connect here, right? As we engage yeah. with people, or how can I serve, you know, or something like that? What else could be helpful to to help us to to really be present with people? Well, you know, one one of the things that also can support us is um, beginning to disengage from some of the activities that are that provide addictive self esteem boosts, but keep us trapped in this drama and 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 keep us from finding a kind of um, uh, satisfaction in ordinariness. Um, let's take social media for example, because this problem um, has gotten very much worse with the advent of social media. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't see a lot of social media posts where people are saying, you know, woke up this morning, have the runs again because I'm anxious, you know, I'm afraid that I'm going to get a bad performance review at work and, you know, uh, my girlfriend or boyfriend is is going to leave me, right? No, it's like, here I am at a fantastic place, doing fantastic things with beautiful people, carefully curated, and you're not included, right? That's what people share with one another. And so just, you know, very simple. Monitor your social media use and notice which of the interactions are actually helping to connect me to other people? Because some do, right? Some are like, you know, connecting with old friends and, and this kind of thing. And which ones are simply activating this social comparison network or simply getting me going, either feeling good or bad, doesn't matter. Either I'm feeling like a winner or I'm feeling like a loser. And then see, you know, is it possible to start changing the amount of time we spend in each of these endeavors? Another approach, I have a a, a friend, uh, Terry Real. He's a, a a couples therapist, and uh, he he thinks a lot about these issues. And he said he tries to monitor himself during the day. And every time he starts to feel the balloon rising, like, hey, aren't I doing great? He like literally tries to tug down on the string and remind himself that we're all human, we're all going to die and all this is nonsense. Or every time he finds himself sinking, try to pull up on the weight and, and remind himself, we're all human, we're all going to die. And this is this is nonsense. You know, that bumper sticker that says whoever has the most toys when they die wins. Well, fill in the blank for toys. You know, all of these things that we work toward, you know, they're so ephemeral. It's so ridiculous. So those kinds of reminders are helpful. Um, something else that's that's uh, that can be very interesting and is actually necessary to really free ourselves from this is to do what we might call a self-esteem autobiography, um, which is to go back through our lives and start to notice what we've been hooked on and when we were hooked on different things at different ages. Um, you can start with something very, very easy. And I, I, if I can, I asked you before if it'd be okay to put you on the spot. So I'm gonna put you on the spot as, uh, as our subject here. If you can go back and you maybe close your eyes for a moment, and I invite our viewers to do this also, and try to identify what was the very first time that I remember having a self-esteem boost, that I remember starting to feel good about myself uh, in some way. And what was that? And I, I actually mentioned mine before. It was, it was the experience of being maybe three or four years old and using some kind of big polysyllabic word, not as big as polysyllabic, but still a big word. And having my dad, I, I knew that he was smiling and somehow proud of that. And I had that. Do you have one that comes comes to mind for you? I do. And actually, when you shared the example with your father earlier, that figured a memory for me. You know, I mean, I guess there were some things when I was younger, but when when I was about 11 or 12, maybe something like that, 
I remember that I went to my dad and uh, I, I, I was asking him a question and somehow, you know, he was able to help me. And then the next day in school, I shared, uh, I think it was the Pythagoras, Pythagoras, what is it? But Pythagoras theory or whatever that is. I knew it and nobody in the class knew it because I, you know, my dad had kind of acknowledged me for knowing it. And I was so, you know, and, uh, and it was such a moment of like, oh my God, I'm smart. You know, I, I can do this. And I, nobody else knew it except for me. And the teacher made a big fuss. And that was like a real self-esteem boost. I think for me, in terms of like me being smart, because it was always, my brother was the smart one. Uh, mm -hmm. really good in math and science. And it was like, I always had kind of A's, but it, I was never brilliant in that. Like I had to work really hard to, to do what I, what I did. And that was the first time that I felt that like, wow, I feel really good about myself. Yeah. Great. And, th and th thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'm going to ask you and our viewers now to do the other side of the coin, which is um, an early memory <clears throat> of, uh, of the opposite. Of, of a feeling of collapse. And um, the one that comes to mind for me is I was, again, probably around the same age, maybe three-ish or so, and went to um, uh, preschool, was called nursery school back then in the States. And I, I went to nursery school and it was my birthday. And uh, my mom sent me in with one of those strings of lollipops, you know, where the cellophane's all connected. So, you know, one for everybody in the class. And I showed up proudly announcing my birthday and I had this to celebrate. And the teacher looked at me and he said, we're a healthy nursery school. We don't eat things like that here. You'll have to take them back home. And the collapse, you know, and somehow these things are worse when we start out boosted and then something pulls the rug out from under us. Um, and, you know, it wasn't my fault, but I, I just felt shame and, you know, a sense of collapse around that kind of thing. Um, uh, you have one you'd like to... What came up for me is uh, soon after we moved to the U.S. when I was about 10, I didn't really speak very much English. Uh, and, and I remember being in the classroom, it was probably the first week in the United States, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't understand what was being said. And I guess maybe there was lice going on in the school, but I didn't know the word. I didn't understand. And I remember all the kids kind of, and I guess maybe I had lice. I don't even know. I don't remember. But everybody was just looking at me and it was just, and I knew that they were making fun of me. I did. And I was singled out. I was kind of pulled out of the classroom. And I just remember feeling immense shame and not really understanding what's going on. And, you know, again, not being good enough. And it was just uh, being ridiculed. It was really yeah. hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry for your experience too. Um, <laughs> the So, so what this leads us to, and we can do this, you can start very early, you can go through, you know, each period, you know, what was it like in elementary school? What was it like in middle school or junior high and, and on and on throughout our lives? And we, we start to see that, oh, gosh, some themes repeat, some themes Luck, you know, I'm no longer so concerned with how I am at kickball, right? But but other things, you know, I'm still hooked on wanting to be smart, you know, when 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 the mind goes, I'm gonna have trouble with that. You know, that you know, so um we start to see, you know, what the building blocks have been like for us, and we start to have the opportunity to rework the past trauma. Cause all of us, and here I use trauma very broadly by meaning some moment that was emotionally painful. And we didn't feel like we had the resources to be able to really tolerate it. So we couldn't really process it. We couldn't really talk about it. We just kind of pushed it away because it hurt too much. And we all have literally thousands of these self-esteem traumas, these moments where we felt like we failed in some way. We usually were ashamed about it and and didn't want other people to see it. We usually didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to think about it. And as kids, we usually either try to get a self-esteem boost to make it go away or try to distract ourselves. Because one of the really interesting things in this whole self-esteem realm is there's nothing like a self-esteem boost to wipe out the pain of a self-esteem collapse, right? That, that uh, and, and we all know this, right? We could feel really down in the dumps. We have some kind of boost. Um, and again, doesn't matter, you know, we look good, got money, thought of ourselves as a nice person, felt like we had, you know, like we were popular, whatever it is, um, the boosts make the pain go away, which is why we get so addicted 
to these booths because they, you know, if I can keep being smart, well, then, you know, all these other feelings of inadequacy are going to go away. And, you know, if, if we think back to our first boyfriend or girlfriend, right, when somebody who we really liked and we saw as, sorry to be crude, but high ranking, right? Because they're desirable. They're good in some way. We think highly of them in some way. Um, and then they like us back. Wow. That just wipes out all the insecurities up until this point, right? Well, because if they love me, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm wonderful, right? You, if the relationship endures long enough, it breaks down and the stuff stops working. But initially, initially, you know, it is, it, it's so very powerful. So um, in order to really free ourselves from this, we kind of have to go back to the childhood ones. I'll give you an, an example. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, I, I get to uh, speak at conferences and things like that from time to time. And I was in one of those situations and it was with uh, um, the other people on the lineup were quite well known in, in my field. And I would say, you know, there, there are a few of them that were certainly more well known than I am um, in the field. Uh, you know, where they're they're kind of like household names among mental health professionals. And uh, we're at one of these speakers receptions. And I started feeling like, hmm, those guys, they happen to be men, you know, who are, you know, in that category, they seem to be wanting to talk to one another more than talk to me, right? It was one of those feelings of not being part of the in-group. And so I took a moment, right? Because I was actually working on this theme at the time. And I took a moment, I thought, okay, so what's this about? What's this reminding me of? And it didn't take long. There I was, a little kid, hanging out with my older brother, where he and his friends were tolerating me, but it was clear that I wasn't part of their age cohort. I was the little kid. And it was they were early adolescents, so and I was still the kid, right? So it was it was at an age where that that division mattered. And they were nice enough, but I definitely felt this way. Being able to connect to the pain of that suddenly is like, oh, <laughs> it's about that, you know, because as the reality is, if they're talking more to me or not talking more to me at this reception, it didn't matter, right? And that somehow shifted things, actually, it shifted things, must have shifted things in my mind so that I was engaging more and felt more like just, you know, regular old ordinary person, but with them as regular old ordinary people too, right? The whole, the whole ranking, the whole hierarchy thing started falling apart and started feeling like just us human beings here together. So there's a lot of work we all have to do on all of these past hurts so that we're not just replaying them because otherwise we're just going to keep doubling down on trying to get successes in order to wipe out the feelings of failure, not just recent ones, not just that upsetting email, but going all the way back um, throughout our childhoods because some we all carry so many of these moments that were, again, not like, you know, being in a war zone, but were for our little minds traumatic. So, Thank you, first of all, for sharing that. I, I really resonated with that story and 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 it helped me personally. the The question then is, let's say somebody becomes conscious of an earlier event that may be of a similar theme, right? Kind of running that same circuit or may even be the root of that circuit. Um, what can they do once they have awareness of it? Because that's the thing. I think a lot of people don't know what to do themselves. I mean, I suppose they could go to a practitioner, a therapist, and so on. But what can they do once they become aware? That, that's a great question. And and this 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 actually points us to another um, tool, which is which can be very very helpful here, and that is deliberately cultivating self compassion. And let me say a few words about self compassion and how it differs from self esteem. Um, the easiest way to see this is to imagine uh, two different parenting choices. Uh, let's say our kid comes home from school feeling feeling really defeated because um, he had really wanted to uh, to be on the baseball team, and it was one of these competitive things, and he didn't make the cut in the tryouts. And if we're thinking about self esteem and boosting our kid's self esteem, we'll say something like. Oh, sweetheart, you know, I'm sorry that happened to you. But remember, 
Remember how great you were in basketball in the fall? You were one of the best players on the team and your team went to the regional championships. You know, you were a star. And, you know, over the winter in mathletes, you were great. You were great. You know, you won, you know, you won the state award, whatever it might be, right? And what we do, which is what so many of us do, is we try to connect with a self-esteem boost to make the self-esteem collapse go away, right? And sometimes it works. If we were trying to help our child develop self-compassion, we would approach it quite differently. We'd say, oh, sweetheart, I'm so sorry. I get how that must be really disappointing. You know, I remember when I was around your age, I was really into drama. I so wanted to be in the school play. And there was a part that I thought was perfect for me. And I tried out for the part and I didn't get it. And I was uh, I was heartbroken. You know, I, I felt embarrassed, uh, you know, uh, and I, I was in pain about that for a while. That That was a real hard one. You know, this is the nature of life. We all win some things and lose some things. We've all got the, you know, we all get our hearts broken when we don't do this. I'm so sorry this has happened to you. Let me give you a hug. It's about, I, I mean, it's interesting. Self-compassion, um, uh, my friend and colleague, Kristen Neff, and, um, and uh, developed a system for, um, uh, for measuring self-compassion. And it, it, it's broken down into three parts that, um, uh, it, when we have a feeling of failure in some way, basically self-esteem collapse, um, we tend to be very self-critical, right? We talk to ourselves in ways that we would never talk to another hu human being. If we did, we wouldn't have any friends or coworkers, right? You idiot. What were you thinking, right? I have no trouble saying this to myself. I don't luckily say you idiot to the, you know, to the other people in my life, right? So, so we become harshly self-critical. Um, we tend to um, uh, withdraw from others, right? We, when we feel ashamed, we feel like we don't want to be seen. We feel like we're not fit to be part of the human family. When we have a self-esteem failure, most of us, we kind of pull back and, and don't want to be seen just then because we, we don't feel fit to be seen. Um, and we become very self-preoccupied, right? We, we get caught in these loops of going over and over. Why didn't I do it differently? How could I have been so foolish? You know, um, boy, I always do that, you know, all, all this kind of uh, self-preoccupation. Well, the, um, the antidote to that would be to deliberately generate some self-kindness instead of the self-criticism, to deliberately see our connection to common humanity rather than isolating so that we could be out there and to be uh, sort of mindfully aware of the process rather than caught in the loop that's that's so self self preoccupied so one of the ways that we can work with the hurts is by deliberately being kind to ourselves deliberately noticing that you know think at any moment when we're having one of these collapses let, let's take the moment where, you know, my colleagues seem more interested in one another than in me. Uh, you know, just to pause for a moment, how many of the billions of people on the planet are experiencing something similar right now, right? Because this is, you know, it's such an archetypal universal human experience to feel like I'm not in the in-group, right? Uh, you know, and how many people have suffered from that uh, over the eons, or for whatever it is, whatever the failure, we've got so much company here, right? Because because this is what it's like to be a human. And it doesn't matter whether you're the CEO of some big corporation, but some bigger corporation is getting the limelight, or, you know, you're the, the guy pick, or the woman, you know, picking the stuff with the haptic feedback band off the shelf at Amazon, right? It, it, it happens to us at, you know, at, at, at all levels in these social hierarchies, right? And, and, um, and then to, you know, to simply try to be aware of it, like, okay, so let's say it's the hurt. This is a moment of disappointment, you know, ouch, it hurts to not be part of the in-group. Can we literally give ourselves a hug? in this moment, you were instinctively, you know, putting your hand over your heart because we, you know, that that helps We give ourselves a, like, it's okay, sweetheart, this happens to everybody. And then if we have close friends we can talk to, 
tell them about it instead of hiding out in shame saying oh this thing happened today and it was really hard for me it it, it threw me right back into my you know early adolescent experience of being the funny looking kid without friends and ouch you know it was hard because it is amazing how simply bringing caring attention to any of these wounds actually allows them to heal so that we're um you know they, they can heal if we bring this loving attention to it as opposed to hiding or trying to escape it with the new boost that that's what's so toxic about the self-esteem addiction is each time we make the hurt go away by scoring a new victory we just leave that lump of unprocessed traumatic experience there and we're just going to stay vulnerable to the next time the next time the next time and we're always going to be scrambling to try to stay on top to to avoid those things but it, if we can really be comfortable with the whole range and of all the times we've ever been injured in this realm and we really get it that this whole the whole enterprise is doomed to fail, um, then each new disappointment becomes an opportunity to rework some of the past hurt and become that much freer. Thank you. I think that was really well said and, and really helpful practical tips for people to access. And I think that for me, the, the big light bulb moment there was, you know, in those moments of pain uh, to be able to consider how others you know, feel in a situation like that, you know, because I think that, you know, it's like giving compassion to others, right? Uh, you know, sometimes can be easier to access than even compassion for ourselves, if we've been really hard on ourselves, like we feel we didn't prepare enough, we didn't whatever enough. But if I can pause and say, you know what, there are many other people in the world that are going through this. It's it's almost like stepping out of myself to look at others, but I'm really also looking at myself. And it, that was just a really beautiful, beautiful tip. And, and I think that for some people, they may not have somebody in their life that they can share the truth of how they feel, the, the truth of their self-evaluation in the moment, um, and, you know, their, their unorderiness, order, order ordinariness, um, you know, with others, because maybe they fear of how others may look at them or what might be the consequences, you know, and, and, and so what can we do, you know, if we don't have somebody like that in our life, you know? Um, interestingly, um, uh, Kristen, again, Kristen F., who did all this work on self-compassion, uh, she invented an, an exercise which, which, um, is very well suited to this this circumstance you're saying. Um, it's to write a uh, a self compassionate letter, and all we need to do we can do this together right now. We can start it. it is to think of a moment of one of these self esteem collapses, like one of these moments where you know where we felt bad, bad about ourselves, and uh, usually it doesn't take long. We've got you know we we you know I mean the irony is it doesn't matter. You know you can be somebody who most people think. Oh, they're fantastically successful. Look, they've got good relationships. They've got um, uh, they they've got uh, you know career or work success and all that. But it doesn't matter. We all have. I mean, it matters in that. Yes, it's certainly worse to be marginalized. It's certainly worse to be um, um, uh, abused and downtrodden. But um, but nonetheless, even those who are apparently on the winning end of this game still have these injuries. So what we do is simply call to mind one of these injuries, right? And then imagine that we have a wise, caring, and loving friend. And that wise, caring, and loving friend has learned of what happened to us, and they're writing a letter to us. What would they say in the letter? And I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you think of a first line of the letter? You can actually write a whole letter, which is quite therapeutic, but but even what a first line of the letter might be. <laughs> oh, the event that I was thinking of is the, the thing that I saw yesterday that somebody unsubscribed, which is, again, mm -hmm. such a silly thing, yep. but still it, it hurt. No, and, I know, yeah. And uh, so the first line would be, who cares? <laughs> you know, like not who cares about how I feel, but who cares if somebody, you know, the, it, it, you know it, mean, it has nothing to do with with you and your value, you know, you're just giving your best and doing so they would best. want to put it in perspective for you. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. With a little humor, yeah. Yeah. And often in these letters, we have the, you know, there's a communication of common humanity of, oh, sweetheart, you know, this happens to everybody or this has happened to me, right? And, and oh gosh, you know, that was hard for me. Um, so we can do that because we all have inside of us a wise part, if you will, that has perspective, has understanding, and has caring. And we can generate that part to take care of ourselves in some ways. Um, something else we can do that's a little bit more on the, um, in the book, I talk about a, a 3H approach to this because uh, it's it's so pervasive, this difficulty, that we need to use our heads our hearts and our habits, right? To to work with this. So the heart level is is what we're talking about here, right? It, it's the the moving toward the pain and finding some caring way to hold and work with the pain. There's a head level we can work on too, which is quite interesting. Um, which is to take whatever the thing is, like you know, let let's pick a um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick mine, like uh, you know. Uh, wanting to be seen as intelligent, right? And then the question becomes, okay, where did I learn that first? You know, like, where did I get that message from? Because we don't make this stuff up, right? We we get this from experiences. And, you know, for me, it's like, you know, stuff like what happened with, um, uh, uh, with my dad and you know, it's it's embarrassing because, you know, now I've got, you know, shame around my narcissism. But, you know, there were years in elementary school anyway, where I was designated the smartest kid in the class, right? And I was totally attached to that. And and I clung to it as compensation for my kickball performance, which was really horrible. And at least up until a certain point, you know, the jocks, you know, fifth grade jocks, you know, called me brain and I was okay because I had that, even though, you know, I was out in left field, literally <laughs> dropping the baseball, right? You know, so, so, um, uh, so, uh, so where did I learn it? I learned, okay, it works, right? You know, oh, you get the praise of the teacher. It works. It makes this stuff um, go away. Then there's the question of what's the grading system, right? Let's say it's intelligence. Is it like lifelong? How many moments I've managed to, you know, look smart? Or is it just, you know, like a cumulative grade point average since birth? Or is it just the last year or the last month or the last week or the last hour, right? You know, <laughs> how did this seem? Because when we step back and look at this, we realize, God, you know, we're feeling good or bad about ourselves, but we never think, well, where'd the grading system come from? And what's the time frame we're talking about? For a lot of us, I, I have a, a, a good friend and colleague, uh, Paul Fulton, very senior wise uh, psychologist. And um, he, he once quipped, he said, yeah, my estimation of myself as a psychologist is about as good as my last session, right? If the last session went well, all these years of study, training, experience, my natural abilities, I'm really good at this. I'm really useful in the world. If the session went badly, you know, gosh, uh, I was a bright guy. I could have gone into so many fields. This is clearly not my calling. Why didn't I do something else, right? Literally based on the last session. And we've, you know, <laughs> I can relate, right? The same thing, the same thing happens to me. So um, so we can use our heads to start seeing so where the messages come from, what's the grading system, how do you know, how does this, how does this work? Um, and then the habit side of it is things like, okay. I'm actually going to limit my um, my social media engagement of the sort that's all about trying to get likes. Uh, ju just to segue into this, you know, for a moment, you know, the genius of Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, the uh, the history, you know, so he's this, you know, undergraduate student at Harvard, right? And uh, he comes up with this thing called face mash which was uh he he took the pictures that were available online of of his classmates posted them and had people evaluate them as basically attractive or not right this is where the whole likes thing started right and you know it took only a few hours before he was getting you know thousands of hits and it took about four days before the officials at harvard figured out what was going on shut down his account and moved to expel him from the university but the so, and that's how Facebook was born. It was born out of realizing this is so powerful. People will do anything to get a like on social 
media and uh, you know or a retweet or a, well you're you're engaged i i assume in uh, uh social media marketing to get the word out about uh, about your work and you know it's all based on this stuff right and you know social uh psychologists they've wired people up and uh put them in uh brain scanners and you can actually see every time somebody gets a like there's basically this squirt of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens which is our, our reward center where it's like it's the same thing handled cocaine with winning gambling with you know with all sorts of all sorts of these things that make us feel good about ourselves and so we start you can notice you, you know simply in social media use again i mentioned this earlier which ones are addicting you to this cycle and which ones aren't what are the other habits we've got that are mostly about trying to get a self-esteem boost and can we replace them with habits that are mostly about connecting with with other people and developing the habit of gratitude we haven't talked about this one yet there's a huge literature in uh in positive psychology which is really the, the science of happiness showing that cultivating gratitude is more powerful than anything else for um uh, uh as a positive psychology intervention and we wonder well why is that well gratitude in a moment of gratitude two things are happening one of them is we're connecting to something larger than ourselves because when we're grateful we're usually grateful to maybe our parents or family we're grateful to our friends we're grateful to mentors maybe we're religious and we're grateful uh uh, to God, or simply in a non-theistic way, grateful to the universe, grateful to be able to walk as, you know, as I move into uh, the age that I'm at and, you know, people are dropping like flies. Hey, I could ride my bike to the pond to go swimming. Good day, you know, worth worth celebrating and, and being grateful for that, right? So it connects us to something larger than ourselves. And it's the flip of desire because every time that we're in some self-esteem collapse, there's this wish, if only I could have this other thing, if only I could be a winner, if only I could be more popular, if only people would see me in, in, in higher regard, if only I saw myself in higher regard, I'd be happier. When we're grateful, we're not, we're not focused on what's not good enough, right? We're, you know, we're we're okay with what is. So, so those kinds of habit changes are, um, are really important and they take work. I, you know, when I was writing the book, the, um, uh, I was shopping titles. I, I did a little focus group among my friends, family, and colleagues, uh, with a number of different titles. And I got quite a few people basically saying, you know, nobody is going to buy a book about being ordinary. Everybody wants to be special. So we start to play with the habits to see, all right, which of the habits are the habits that make me feel okay with being ordinary, that make me actually celebrate, you know, an ordinary moment. It could be just, you know, going for a walk where you were not proving anything to anybody. Um, it could be the, the conversation with a friend. It could be, you know, just helping somebody out where nobody's, nobody is seeing it. Um, uh, you know, so actually doing things that underscore and celebrate our ordinariness. Oh, it's it's so tremendous, you know, and it's and in a way, embracing being ordinary, right? Accepting that gift is extraordinary because most people are not doing that, right? So. It's hard to do, right? Because <laughs> we get so addicted to this other stuff and we get so many messages uh, suggesting um, you know, the 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 pathway. I mean, it's it's this is not an argument against free markets. Uh, other forms of social organization certainly have their problem, but it is a problem that because these instincts for basically the you know social rank concern instincts are so powerful, almost all advertisers play on it. And they they reinforce it. I, I fly uh, on airplanes a fair amount and guilty about my carbon footprint, but I enjoy traveling and speaking and stuff. And uh, you, you know, you you line up at the gate. Okay, we start with the first class passengers. Okay, they paid an ungodly amount of money for their ticket. Please. And then the military. Okay, fine. People with little kids, understandable. But then we start with the pure 
straight up social ranking. The executive platinum plus passengers will get on next, followed by just the platinum, then the gold, then the silver. And God forbid you should be one of the eight lumped proletariat that get to sl slink onto the plane and look for a place in an overhead com compartment, you know, totally devoid of social rank. Like, what are they selling here? Yes, it's nice to get your bag on, but it's not just about that. Look at the names. I mean, it's, you know, we're selling this stuff all the time and and we we marinate in it we get used to it i i don't uh i've only rarely flown business class but i i remember uh one such adventure where somebody else was paying for it so i was flying business class and i started feeling superior because i was in business class. I thought, my god it actually works this is psychotic but it actually works wow <clears throat> Ron, I'm so incredibly grateful to you. This has been so, um, for me personally, so valuable, our conversation today, because I'm realizing just how much of this I have been doing and how much suffering it has created in my life. And um, and I, my wish is that every person listening will apply the practices that you've suggested to us to interrupt those patterns give ourselves more self-compassion, more compassion for others and be able to shift some of that neurology, some of that focus so we can find more ease in the ordinary moments, more peace in that and, and receive that extraordinary gift as you spoke about. So thank you again. How can people learn more about you, uh, invite you to be a speaker at their event, uh, more about your books and so on? Uh, well, I have a website, uh, Dr. RonSiegel.com. And uh, um, maybe you can um, put a link to that uh, as part of the program notes. And uh, if you want to uh, check out the book, it's it's filled with a lot of different exercises that are designed to um, to help help free us. It's 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 the best I was able to collect in a, a spending several years trying to figure out what might work for me, what might work for my uh, clients and colleagues and and the like. So um, it's another resource. Yeah, and it's an excellent resource. I've been reading it and, and getting a lot of value from it. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Siegel and Ron, for your time, for the important work that you do in our world, um, and uh, for for making it okay to to feel ordinary yeah. and, and well, to find peace and, and love and, and joy in that. Mm -hmm. Well, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, everybody out there who's listening. And thank you for such a thoughtful and engaged, engaged and engaging interview. Thank you.